it is surrounded by a capsule called the glomerular capsule or the um, Bowman's capsule, right? So capsule, I'm going to call it Bowman's because that's what everybody calls it. But it's also the glomerular capsule that makes this the glomerulus. The glomerulus, as we'll talk about here in a little bit, has an entry and an exit, right? The entry is the, um, the afferent arteriole, and the exit is the efferent arteriole. Okay? All together, this part right here is called the corpuscle. So arguably the most complicated anatomical part of the nephron, right, is this first part. So the corpuscle is the glomerulus inside the capsule. Now, it doesn't end there. So what we're going to see is that fluid leaves the uh, glomerulus and enters this space, right? Eventually, that fluid is going to leave through this tubule, right? So then we have a windy spot like this. So this is called the PCT, proximal convoluted tubule, right? We're going to talk about what happens there today. Then from the PCT we go, we have this big long loop that goes down and back up. This is the nephron loop. Nephron loop. Usually people will say of Henley. Okay, that's an end. Loop of Henley is what we call this thing. And then we have another windy bit here. This is called the DCT, distal convoluted tubule, right? And then from there, we go out into the collecting system. And the collecting system, kind of like a tree, the ends of lots of nephrons attached to the common collecting system. That's what I mean by these. These are other nephrons that are ending here. Um, and this goes out. So this is the collecting duct. Okay, so you should be able to draw that and label it like I just did. And it, eventually, you're going to know what each of these different parts do. Okay, so more so than probably any of the other organ systems, the nephron, the structure of the nephron really defines and describes what the kidney does. All the kidney is, is a whole bunch of these, millions of these, right? So if you understand what each one does, you'll have a pretty good sense of what the whole kidney does. Okay, now there's some um, interaction between nephrons in this area right here, but we'll talk about that probably uh, next time. Okay, so we jump in today to... Renal physiology. So we take this anatomy and we're going to put it in motion. All right. So all in all, what we need the kidney to do is we need to get it, the kidney needs to get rid of uh, waste products, things the body doesn't need, things the body has to get rid of or they build up and become toxic without getting rid of anything that the body does need, which is trickier than it sounds. Because, you know, think about um, a water filter. You know, you, you can put dirty water into a filter and clean water comes out. Okay, that part's easy. Well, what if some of what's in that dirty water is something you want to go through that filter? Now it just got a lot more difficult, right? So in the kidney, we have that challenge. You know, we want to get rid of the, the dirt, the waste products, but mixed in with that molecular those molecular waste products are good molecules that we can use to, to live and we can use to reduce our need for intake. So ultimately, we want to see uh, good stuff go um, in or good stuff be conserved and waste products be eliminated. So one way to look at that is to look at uh, plasma and urine. Okay, plasma is the liquid part of blood. Right? It's the blood, or yeah, it's the blood with the cells removed. Okay? Well, ultimately, urine starts as 
plasma, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. So we take blood and we push it through a filter, and the filter is, has holes small enough where blood cells can't make it through the filter. You know, so think about your water filter analogy again. You know, if your water has sand in it and you pour it through filter paper, well, the sand doesn't go through because the, the sand can't fit through the holes of the filter paper, right? So that's what happens here in the glomerulus. We have filtration. So the plasma leaves the glomerulus. All the cells stay behind. So the red cells, the white cells, and the um, uh, platelets, as well as the proteins, also stay behind. Proteins are large molecules, huge molecules. So they also are too big to fit through the holes. Well, if urine was just that, if it ended right there, its characteristics would be a little bit like this. You know, it would look just like plasma. So high sodium, right, relatively low potassium, um, relatively high chloride, bicarbonate that's level that's pretty high. You know, this is what you find in the blood. This is what you find in the plasma. Um, glucose levels that are quite high to fuel the brain and other tissues. Lipids that are high, amino acids that are high, and proteins that are very, very high, right? Lots of proteins in the plasma, okay? And then we'll have some waste products, right? Because the blood is the transportation network for everything. So you're always going to find waste products in the blood, but they're on their way somewhere, specifically to the kidney. So you're going to have some urea, you're going to have some creatinine, ammonia, and uric acid. But if you look at these numbers, completely particularly compared to these, they're all very, very small, right? So we have very little waste products in the blood. So what the kidney does is take this fluid that has these characteristics and very smartly modify it so that it has some different characteristics. All right, so we'll start with the ions here at the top. So circulating in the blood, we have a sodium level that's really remarkably stable between 135 and 145 regardless of how much salt is in our diet. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. So we can eat a lot of salt in our diet or very little salt in our diet and our salt level doesn't change. Well, how is that possible? Because the kidney can either dump extra salt, in other words, have sodium concentration that's higher than the plasma, you know, so that's you have very salty potato chips, right? So we have extra salt to get rid of. Or it can very highly conserve salt, so that what's found in the urine has much less salt in it than the blood does. So we have a narrow range here and a broad range here, right? So this broad range shows that the kidney is able to change how it secretes or excretes sodium according to what the body needs. Eat more salt, so the kidney has to excrete more salt or else our salt level would go up, and that can be um, hugely detrimental. Okay, so that's sodium. Potassium, hopefully you remember from last semester that most of the body's potassium is found inside of cells, right? Inside cells, potassium is high, sodium is low. Outside cells, it's just the opposite. That's what makes that membrane potential that you all talked about last uh, semester. Well, <clears throat> potassium in our diet also changes, sometimes dramatically. You know, depending on what we're eating, we can have very little potassium in our diet or lots and lots of potassium. So similar to sodium, the kidney has to be able to respond to that. So it has a wide range. And you'll notice these numbers are much higher than these numbers. It's because what the uh, urine contains potassium that would be inside of cells as well as potassium that would be outside of cells. So... Like when you eat something high in potassium, like potatoes are high in potassium, so are bananas. That potassium, it doesn't stay in the blood. It goes right inside the cells. But it's still in you. It's still in your body. So you have a potassium, a total potassium content that changes according to what you eat. Well, the kidney has to get rid of that total potassium, whether it's inside of cells or outside of cells. So we see that these numbers are higher than um, what we find in the plasma. But this is the body getting rid of potassium that's above and beyond what the body needs in our diet, which is very common. You know, our typical American diet has way more potassium than we actually need. Now, it doesn't necessarily hurt us. That's what our, you know, our kidneys handle that very well. <clears throat> okay. Chloride is the only one in this list that really isn't very different. Um, and that's because chloride 
despite its reactivity in the laboratory, is relatively inert in us, in living things. Um, chloride is really just there to balance the charge that sodium and potassium have. You know, so yes, there's a range for chloride, but pretty much wherever sodium goes, chloride follows. Same with potassium. Wherever potassium goes, chloride follows because of its opposite charge. So that one's not as important. <clears throat> Bicarbonate is a molecule the body needs and the body can use. Remember, by having bicarbonate, we can get rid of acid by blowing off CO2. Remember, we talked about that equation, H2O plus CO2 yields carbonic acid, which breaks down into bicarbonate and or a hydrogen ion. So because this is a useful molecule, the, the kidney conserves it. So we have a high level in the plasma, very low level relativ relativity, relatively, let me get that word out, um, in the urine. So we have conservation of bicarbonate. Now, this can change. Really, this should have a range. Because let's say you've been munching on tums all day because your stomach was upset. Well, your bicarbonate level in your blood is now too high. And the, the kidney's adaptation to that will be to dramatically increase the amount of bicarbonate in your urine to get rid of that excess. So this can actually change, okay, even though the, the book doesn't say that, it should. All right, so these are the ions, common ions. You'll see a similar pattern for any of the others, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, any of those, you'll see that the um, concentrations in plasma are uh, stable while the concentrations in the urine change, depending on what the body needs. So let's say you're on a calcium kick and you've taken away lots of calcium supplements. Well, the calcium level in your urine is gonna go up as the body seeks to keep that calcium level normal, right? It's gonna dump it into the urine. So we can see that up here too. All right, well, what about <clears throat> uh, nutrients? You know, we talked a lot about these in the last unit, right? Glucose is a carbohydrate. Lipids, amino acids, proteins, all things the body can use for anabolism, catabolism, or energy production. So the last thing we would want to do is lose these things in the urine, right? Because why, you know, we have to eat to get these things. So if we lost them, we'd have to eat even more, and that would be very inefficient, which life tends to not be. So in the plasma, we have high levels of these things, <clears throat> but in the urine, we have very, very low levels. So this is proof that the kidney is able to conserve these nutrients. Now what's interesting is except for proteins and lipids, glucose and amino acids do come out right here. So they are in the beginnings of what become urine. But in this very first part, in the proximal convoluted tubule, those valuable nutrients are reabsorbed back into the bloodstream so that they don't come out the other end as lost nutrients, right? So in the urine, there is typically no glucose, all right, that is, for effectively speaking, none, right? So 0 0.009. There is no lipid. There's a tiny few bits of amino acids, depending on your diet, and there's no protein. So all of the things that the body uses for its own metabolism are absent in the urine. That is a good system. We put the dirty water in, but we kept the stuff in the dirty water that we can use, even though the, the waste water comes out. Okay. So conservation is this piece. Ion control is this piece. So the last piece is, how do we get rid of the waste products then? Well, all four of these are molecules our bodies make as part of our metabolism that we have to get rid of. We have to get rid of them, number one, because we can't do anything more with them. We don't have the biochemistry to break these things down any further. And number two, if they exist in too great a concentration, they're toxins, right? Classic waste product, you gotta get rid of it. So urea, we talked about last unit, right? This is when we break down amino acids for energy production, we have to take the nitrogen off, right? The ammonia group. Well, those ammonia become urea, and in the plasma, the urea level is pretty low, but in the urine, it's very, very high. This is concentration, okay? The kidney is able to concentrate waste products in the urine so that a small volume of urine can carry out a large number of um, waste molecules, right? 
If we didn't have this ability, our urine output would be three or four times as great as what it is in a day. And that would mean our water consumption would have to go up by three or four times. So we would literally be drinking all day in order to make the, the waste products be able to um, leave the body. So the kidney, wanting to conserve water so we have to drink less, concentrates these things. So compared to the plasma for um, urea, creatinine, ammonia, and uric acid, these numbers are much, much higher than these numbers are. Right. So that says the kidney is good at putting lots of waste product in a small amount of urine volume. Okay. So this is sort of the overall, this is what happens at the kidney. Now, how these different pieces happen are where we go next. All right. So <clears throat> urine is very different from plasma, even though its origins are the same, which is the, um, the water or the fluid component of blood. Okay. So the three processes that make that report card possible, this is all the kidney does, right? Um, is filtration, secretion, and reabsorption. Those are the three processes. All right, so let's look at each one. Filtration is where you take a fluid that has stuff in it and you push it through a filter. You know, what is a filter? A filter keeps some things out while allowing other things to go through, right? You know, that's an air filter, that's a water filter, that's what it does. Well, in the kidney, the filtration occurs in only one place, and that's at the glomerulus. So between the glomerulus and this glomerular capsule is where filtration happens. And it happens by taking blood, which is under pressure, and pushing it through a filtration membrane, which we're going to talk much more about later. So this filtration membrane ends up creating these little holes. You see these little holes? Small things can fit through the holes. Large things cannot fit through the holes, right? So big things get stuck in the blood. Small things can squeeze through the little holes and become filtrate, which is what starts the process of urine production. So in this capsule right here, there's filtrate entering that capsule all the time. All right. What comes next after filtration is both secretion and reabsorption. Reabsorption is where solutes that were filtered, so green circles here, right? So green circles came out of the blood into the filtrate. Some of those small molecules are things we can use, things like glucose, amino acids, lipids, right? So reabsorption is the process of taking those solutes, green circles, and pumping them back into the blood, right? So we pump it into the peritubular fluid is peri is near, tubule is this tube, so peritubule is fluid near the tubule, right? Wherever you see peritubular fluid, you can think blood, because eventually what enters the peritubular fluid enters the blood, um, and then is carried back into the circulation. So we have filtration, pushes stuff out, reabsorption selectively pulls stuff back in. So this process does not discriminate. Right? If the molecule is small enough, it will pass through this hole. That's physics. Right? There's no transporter. There's no fancy life chemistry happening. This is pure physical size. Reabsorption, however, uses transport proteins, which are very specific. So only molecules that there are transporters for get reabsorbed. Right? This is one of the tricks of the kidney. The kidney can get rid of a waste product that it's never encountered before. Because the way it gets rid of wastes is non-selective. So anything it doesn't on purpose pull back into the body stays in the urine and goes out <clears throat> with the urine. But in the case of molecules the body does know something about, those things are pumped back in um, if, uh, to conserve those nutrients. So that's reabsorption. And then the last bit is secretion. Secretion is like the opposite of reabsorption. In secretion, we take solutes from the blood, i.e. peritubular fluid, and we pump them into what will become the urine. So this is done for potassium, for example. When your potassium level gets too high, aldosterone is released. Aldosterone causes potassium to be pumped into the urine and therefore out of the body. Right? Anything that goes into the urine and stays in the urine eventually leaves the body. So excess potassium. Many medications are pumped out in the same way. Um, 
Hydrogen ions can be pumped out like this. Anything that the kidney can and wants to get rid of can be secreted into the urine and therefore removed from the body. So we're going to see filtration occurs in only one spot, reabsorption occurs in multiple spots, and secretion occurs in multiple spots, right? So um, we'll see that as we go here. All right. So just some sort of coarse examples of this, of these three processes at work. Okay, so here's the glomerular capsule, right? And this big green arrow is filtration. So fluid is pushed against this filter membrane. It's pushed out of the blood and into this capsular space right here. Okay, that begins the process of urine production. That filtrate, which is what we call this stuff, then travels into the proximal convoluted tubule right here where it undergoes two important reabsorptions in blue. One is water, the other is uh, nutrients um, and other solutes that are reabsorbed. Okay, more on that in a minute. So we get lots of water coming back in, lots of good solutes coming back out. And then here we have a little bit of secretion, right? So this is solutes being pumped in to the proximal convoluted tubule. All right, so you have dotted lines and solid lines. Dotted lines are things that vary according to what the body needs. Solid lines are things that happen all the time, regardless of what the body's condition is. So, you know, why have both? Well, this process of filtration is sloppy. In other words, a lot of good stuff is filtered um, that the body could use. Because of that, and because that's always true, Water and solute in huge amounts are reabsorbed right away. All right. If this wasn't the case, and there's a number coming up later about it, our urine output would be like 100 liters a day or something like that. So we have to pull that water and solute back in in order to not literally dehydrate in minutes. So because that's needed all the time, it's present all the time. Where these dotted lines are going to change according to the body's current state. You know, if you're on a high salt diet, you're going to have more salt um, secretion than if you're on a low salt diet, for example. Okay, so we have reabsorption and secretion. In the nephron loop, first we have reabsorption of water going down, right? Then on the way back up, we have the reabsorption of solute, namely salt in this case. Okay, much more on that later. This is just overview still. Then we get into the distal convoluted tubule here. We have some uh, reabsorption of solute that happens all the time. And then we have variable secretion and reabsorption. And then in the collecting duct, we have, again, variable um, reabsorption of water, secretion of salt and potassium, reabsorption of water. Okay, so you're going to see examples of all these as we go uh, through this unit. All right. I'm not a big fan of big tables with text. I'm a visual person. I like pictures. But this is a rare example in your book where this is actually a decent study guide for the whole nephron. So if, you are, if you're a reader, this is a, you know, very much a star-worthy slide. Because this goes through each of the different parts and shows you what's happening in each part. Right. So in the corpuscle, we have filtration. See that 180 liters per day? That's how much fluid enters all the capsules of all your nephrons in both kidneys. Well, 180 liters per day, you know, the typical plasma volume is only like four to six liters. So you would literally die of dehydration if something else didn't happen after that, right? So we have this massive amount of filtration, but then we have this huge amount of reabsorption that happens immediately after. Okay, so of that 180 liters, 60 to 70 percent of the water in that, so that's 108 to 116 liters per day, is reabsorbed right away in this first part, reabsorbed, right? So most of the water is back in. 99 to 100 percent of the nutrient molecules are reabsorbed here. So even though a boatload of glucose left here, it's gone by the time you get to here because it's all been reabsorbed back into the blood for use by the body. Right, And we have, um, in the proximal convoluted tubule, a couple of different kinds of reabsorption. Um, active just means it involves energy. Energy is used. ATP is used. Um, passive is uh, diffusion. It's just traveling down its concentration gradient. So there's no need to spend ATP to recover those things. 
Um, and then we have secretion. Remember, secretion is the opposite of reabsorption. Secretion is putting something from the blood into the urine, where reabsorption takes things out of the urine and back into the blood, right? So keep those two separate. And then, um, well, we're going to talk about each of these as we go, so I'm not going to go over this whole slide. This is just a good um, summary. And like I say here, you should know what each segment of the nephron does. So very good slide, but we're going to talk about it in pictures instead. Okay. <clears throat> so this, the first part of the nephron here is roundish. Because it's roundish, we call it a corpuscle, because that's kind of what corpuscle means. It's a roundish state. Well, inside this roundish thing is, can you turn that front light off for me? Our washed out colors here, that'll be better. <clears throat> okay, so we zoomed in to the front part right here. Now, do you see how this is not, this picture, the little picture, doesn't look exactly like this? The nephrons actually twist around on themselves so that the proximal convoluted tubule and distal convoluted tubules are sort of, so they cross each other. This is more accurate than this schematic picture, right? Just so you don't think that this is better than that, because it's not. That's a better picture. But this is easier to draw, <laughs> right? So I just unwound it. And in your later courses, some of you, um, when you learn about renal pathophysiology, you're going to learn that that's actually a really important relationship, that little crossing over a bit. But we don't need to get into it. OK, so corpuscle here at the beginning. <clears throat> Afferent arterial, that brings blood in. Efferent arterial brings blood out. From the efferent arterial, blood goes into the peritubular capillaries, which we saw last week, right? The capillaries follow the tubule around and gather up anything that's reabsorbed. Okay. In between those two arterioles is our little knot or tuft of capillaries here, which is called the glomerulus, okay? Now, the glomerulus has blood flowing through it all the time and blood under pressure, right? This is an arterial. Arterials have the heart's blood pressure behind it all the time, so there's a pressure head. That pressure is pushing fluid through these little slits, okay? So wrapped around these capillaries are these cells in purple called podocytes. Podis is foot, so a podocyte has many feet, right? Okay, and I think you can see that. You know, here is a, uh, you know, here's a foot, here's a foot, here's a foot. So the neighboring podocytes feet interlock like fingers. You know, not completely. They're not tight like that. They have little gaps in between, but they interlock like that. And on the podocytes, the feet are called pedicels, right? So podocytes have pedicels. The pedicels are the fingers that kind of interlock. And by having this relationship, we create these little slits. Do you see all you can see of the capillary is through this wavy slit through the fingers? We call those filtration slits, um, which is uh, where one of, one of the barriers to substances passing from blood into capsule. More on that in the next slide. Okay, so surrounding this structure of capillaries, podocytes with their pedicels, we have this thin-walled capsule called the glomerular capsule or the capsule of Bowman, Bowman's capsule. And in between these two, there's a space. You know, you can see this space. Well, that space is filled with fluid. The fluid that accumulates from filtration um, accumulates in this capsule and then leaves through the um, proximal convoluted tubule, which is right here. Okay. So if we took kind of a cross section through this um, uh, glomerular capillary, it would look a little bit like this, right? So here's the wall of the capillary. Remember, the walls of capillaries are cells, right? Like everything in the body is cells. So these cells are very thin. Do you see how they're thin right here? And they're sort of weird capillaries because they have a bunch of holes in them. So we call them fenestrated. Fenestrated means like a colander is fenestrated, right? Um, so it has these capillary walls have lots of holes. And then surrounding them, here are those podocytes in cross-section two. This is what it looks like under the electron microscope, right? So here is the capillary wall. And then here are the podocytes. And then they have these little slits 
um, where the pedicels um, interlock. So it really does look like this. This isn't like a made up or theoretical thing. Okay. Well, why bother with all this? The idea is to create a filtration membrane. Now, what we need to have happen is we don't want blood cells in this capsule space because you would never want to get rid of blood cells, right? You know, it's only in the modern day where you can actually get too many blood cells because somebody gave you too many blood cells in the hospital. In evolutionary time, that was not possible. You couldn't have too many. So there's no reason to ever get rid of red blood cells. So we want our filter to hold red blood cells back while allowing other stuff to go through. Another thing you'd never want to get rid of is white cells or platelets, right? And then the last thing is proteins, because proteins are hard to make. Proteins take a lot of energy to make. So we don't want to get rid of protein either. So we need to have holes in our filter that are smaller than the smallest proteins that we want to hold on to. That's why this elaborate structure of these filtration slits. These slits are very, very thin. So in the end, if we zoom in and look at um, uh, the area between capillary and capsule, we can see this filtration membrane. So here is the wall of the capillary, right? The thin wall, and it has pores because it's fenestrated. Okay, so it has little holes. Then we have a, a layer called the dense layer. This is basement membrane. Remember, all epithelial cells sit on a basement membrane. We talk about this in the respiratory chapter too. Well, the endothelial cells of the capillary are epithelial cells, so they have a basement membrane. And the uh, podocytes have a basement membrane too but they're joined together in what we call the dense layer. Now, it looks like there's no holes in this dense layer, but there is. It's porous. In other words, the dense layer has many tiny holes in it, you know, similar to filter paper like you've all used in the laboratory, or like paper towel. You know, it is porous. You can pass stuff through it. And then on the other side, these are the pedicels, right, of the interlocking feet of the podocytes. And between those pedicels are filtration slits. So this is a hole. So in order to get into this capsular space and begin the process of urine making, substances have to pass through all three of these layers, right? Red cells are too big to fit through the holes in the capillary. So they're held back. So are white cells, so are platelets. The largest proteins are also too big to fit through here. The smaller proteins cannot fit through the dense layers holes or through the filtration slits holes. So all that passes through this filter are the smallest of molecules, right? So that's simple sugars, simple amino acids, um, small molecules like urea, nothing larger than a few amino acids strung together is what passes through. So it's a highly selective membrane. The problem is, is that a lot of the most important molecules in our bodies fall into that category of small molecules, right? Like simple sugars, like amino acids. We don't want to lose those things. Like uh, nucleotides fall into that category too. So large stuff stays behind, small stuff comes through, but that can't be the end of it, right? So we have to be able to recover those small molecules. Water counts as a small molecule too, right? It's one of the smallest molecules in the body. Okay, so the filtration membrane. So similar to the respiratory membrane that we talked about a while back, this, you know, why know all this detail? Why do we care that there are these three layers and these holes? Well, there is a, a handful, of six to ten, um, kidney diseases that are entirely explainable by problems at this spot, at the filtration membrane. So yes, it may seem esoteric right now, but when you start to learn about diseases of the kidney, it's going to make a lot of sense. You know, so for example, nephrotic syndrome is a breakdown in the dense layer, and it allows tons of protein to come from the blood into the urine. So the patient um, has a lot of protein in their urine. That can cause problems all by itself. But more importantly, the loss of those plasma proteins means that they lose that pulling force into the blood, that blood colloid osmotic pressure. Hopefully that sounds familiar. Without that, they swell up. So it's not uncommon for a person with nephrotic syndrome to have um, 
you know, 10 or 20 grams per liter of protein in their uh, urine, and they'll gain 10 to 20 pounds per day because the fluid won't stay in their vessels. It leaks out into their tissues, and they get more and more swollen. So that's just one disease, and there's a dozen more like that where it's all explainable by stuff right here. So worth knowing, filtration memory. Okay. So since we're so here's the filtration membrane. Now, just like a water filter, um, and I know some of you have uh, you built a water filter in your previous classes, but you need some kind of pressure to make a filter work. Um, you know, even if it's just gravity, you know, you, you put water in and you wait for it to dribble out, right? Well, there's still a pressure. The planet is pulling the water down through that filter all the time. Well, in our bodies, we need more oomph than that. So our filtration system, it's a power filter. In other words, there's a pressure behind it that's pushing um, small molecules through those slits. That pressure is created by the heart. You're very familiar with it. It's blood pressure. Okay, so the kidney creates urine using blood pressure to drive filtration, to push blood up against this membrane, up against this filtration membrane. It pushes it here. That allows only the small, well, where's that picture? Yeah, that, that pressure push, allows only the small molecules out. Everything larger stays in. Okay, so that's the big 50 here, right? That's blood pressure pushing fluid out. Now, this is a complicated system. You know, there's there are more forces at work than simply the heart pushing. Similar to what we saw at the capillary bed, how there was pushing forces and pulling forces and they balance out a bit. Same thing here. Okay, so glomerular hydrostatic pressure. Hydrostatic is, is pressure of a fluid on its surroundings. Okay, that's blood pressure, essentially, is one version of that. So glomerular, that's where it is. Hydrostatic is, is what type it is. So glomerular hydrostatic pressure is the pressure inside the glomerular capillaries, inside these guys, right? Where does it come from? It comes from the heart. But for now, we're going to call it GHP. So it's pushing out because there's more pressure in here than there is out here. There is also that colloid osmotic pressure pulling in. Same reason it did in the capillary. The blood has so much protein dissolved in it that it's pulling water in towards it all the time. It's an osmotic pressure. It's pulling in. So it's going in the opposite direction. So it, it, um, here we have 50. Here we have 25 pulling back in. And then the last one is the capsule itself. This is rigid. Okay, Even though these cells are very thin, they're not elastic. So this capsule can't get any bigger. And fluid can only get out of it so fast, all right? So we have one of those, you know, crazy math problems where, you know, you've got only one drain and the water goes at this rate, and then, but you're filling the bathtub at the same time, right? It's one of those calculus uh, type um, questions. So anyway, because fluid can't leave as infinitely fast, there is a pressure in this capsule pushing back against glomerular hydrostatic pressure. We call that capsular hydrostatic pressure here. So because the capsule can't expand and there's a limit to the how fast it can move out, it pushes back. So if we take this 50 going out, subtract the 25 and 15 going in, we have a net filtration pressure of 10. Now, are the numbers here important? No, the numbers are not important because the numbers can change according to what your blood pressure is like, your output, lots of variables. The point is, which, what are the players? So this is changeable, right? Glomerular hydrostatic pressure can change because blood pressure can change. We did a whole bunch of alphabet soup on the board about that, right? About how blood pressure can change. So this one can change. These two really don't change. The capsular hydrostatic pressure, that's geometry, drives that. And the colloid osmotic pressure, hour to hour anyway, doesn't change. Now, maybe day to day, if you had some illness, it might, like nephrotic syndrome, but typically this doesn't change either. So because this is the only thing that can change, changes in hydrostatic pressure are what change net filtration pressure. And it's this net pressure pushing out that drives filtration in the first place. 
which is where glomerular filtration rate comes from. Okay, so a lot in that. So blood pressure causes this, right? That means it can change. As this changes, this changes because these two don't. Does that make sense, everyone? Okay, good. Because what we're going to do is we're going to take that filtration pressure pushing out, and we're going to use that pressure to push fluid into this capsular space. Okay. Once fluid leaves the blood and enters the capsule, we call it filtrate. So why don't we call it urine? Because it isn't anything like urine yet. So we don't call it urine yet. We call it filtrate. So that's what enters the proximal convoluted tubule. That's what fills Bowman's capsule is filtrate. Now, <clears throat> this is happening all the time. You know, this is a static picture, but this is a dynamic system, right? There's always blood pressure. There's always fluid being pushed out. That fluid is always leaving the capsule. It's always traversing the nephron. This is in motion all the time, right? So there's this flow from filtrate through the nephron, out into the kidney, into the bladder where it's stored, and then emptied and stored and emptied and so on. Okay, so the rate at which filtrate is made, we call that glomerular filtration rate. Of all the measures of kidney function, this is the most important one. Because it is filtration, it's what happens here that gets rid of waste products. All the rest of the nephron is to conserve stuff that we want to keep and to get rid of extra stuff that we want to get rid of. But we, we keep our urea level down, our creatinine level down, and our ammonia level down by glomerular filtration rate. So here, let me just give you an example of what that means. If your GFR were to drop by 50%, you would have ever-increasing amounts of waste products in your blood. You would be in the beginnings of kidney failure, right? Because kidney failure is typically the inability to get rid of metabolic waste products. That's how kidneys fail, is when their glomerular filtration rate drops or fails, okay? So <clears throat> we follow kidney dysfunction by following glomerular filtration rate. You know, so if you have a patient whose kidneys are failing, one of the first things you're going to look for in the chart is what their current GFR is, because that's going to determine what you're going to do for the next. So I spend a little time on this point because it comes up clinically a lot. So GFR is the rate at which fluid enters all of the glomerular capsules of all the nephrons in both kidneys, right? So it's a whole body measure. Yes, you can measure GFR for a single nephron, but you'd never do that in a patient. You know, that's the kind of thing you might do in a laboratory, but not in a patient. So in the patient, we do the whole kid both kidneys, all the nephrons. Okay. And like I said, that's where we get rid of waste products. This is what determines if somebody needs dialysis. Dialysis is a machine that um, does filtration, reabsorption uh, mechanically, um, using diffusion to make that happen. And when does a patient need that? It, they need it when their GFR is insufficient to get rid of all the urea that they make, right? So um, <clears throat> it, just to show you the importance of it. So what kind of numbers are we talking about here? Well, typically, a normal GFR is about 125 milliliters per minute. Now, that doesn't sound like very much, but, you know, think about a, um, you know, a, let's see, that's about four ounces per minute, Okay. So that's more than you think, and there's a lot of minutes, <laughs> right? So it multiplies. So at 125 milliliters per minute, that's about 48 gallons per day, right? So um, nobody drinks that much water to have that kind of urine output, right? Unless you're a racehorse of some kind um, or a camel. But <laughs> that's about 70 times the amount of blood in your body. So it shows you that filtration is just the beginning of what the nephron actually does. The rest is going to be reabsorption and to some of less extent secretion. All right. So GFR changes from moment to moment and from nephron to nephron <coughs> by changing this. So glomerular hydrostatic pressure comes from the heart. Well, blood pressure doesn't change very much, but these uh, efferent 
efferent and afferent arterioles can work as valves. So by opening or by getting smaller or larger, the input and output of blood can change the hydrostatic pressure, which changes the filtration pressure, which changes the GFR. Right? So the control that the body has on glomerular filtration rate is by control of blood pressure and blood flow into the, into the nephron, particularly into the um, glomerular capillary. So we'll pick up on the control bit um, next time, because then we can talk about all those pieces at the same time. All right? The questions. We have a couple minutes. Yes. Um, in the lab, because I work at the lab, um, we have like a range for African American and men month. African American is based that is far on. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Yeah. Uh, so Oh, why is, why is there a, um, I call it genetic heritage, where did your genes come from? Why is there a difference between different places? It probably has to do with water availability. You know, so the drier your climate, in many ways, the lower you want your GFR to be. Um, it, it, I don't know, is it lower or higher? It's, um, the range is different. It's just different. It's different for African American and non African American. Yeah. You know, I'm sure if you went ethnicity by ethnicity, you could find a whole variety of differences between. And it's, it has nothing to do, it has to do with where did your genes come from and what was the environment like. You know what I mean? It's the same reason why, you know, people of African descent have dark skin. It's because there's more UV in Africa than there is in Northern Europe. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, I don't know. That's the only reason I have. And kidney disorders are pretty much the same across different groups. Ethnicities have different tendencies, but all told, our kidneys are all equally brittle. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we have a question about So we have two ideas that are no, it's a good idea to do that. I want you to go and talk to these stories and see what's happening. Yeah. Are you going to do that? See that in my next text. Yeah. I don't know if you want to yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay.
So that's usually why people are always trying to find it. So there's four of them in the slide. Because the less salt you have, the less one layer of salt you have, the less one layer of salt you have, the less one layer of salt you have. So if you can keep your salt, you're that low. Oftentimes you can get off the other side of the salt. Now, the other side of the salt. You wouldn't want that if you were healthy. Because it's me like you. The lower your sign is, the same way. So it means somebody who's healthy is super close to the other side. They get more of the static. Yeah, they did. Like, oh, because yeah. they barely have the yeah, like, no oh, okay. So, salt gets a bad rap. I was salt is part of the rap. I was also wondering how high blood pressure damage is taking. I've always heard that. Like, Very high blood pressure. Oh, okay. Um, that pressure coming into the glomerulus, the glomerulus capillaries, because they're thin, are fragile. So when you have a lot of pressure going into the veins while they scar, the response of blood vessels to high pressure is they resist the pressure. They get tougher and tougher, but by getting tougher, they are less porous. Right. So by the time you get to 78, with high blood pressure down here, you've got all these scarred glomeruli in your kidney function. Okay. Thanks. Good question. If you're thinking like that. Alright, Dr. Keith, we're thinking of hard murmur. Ooh, good Is that one. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, are you going to use audio? Probably. We're going to stay in the default. Okay. <laughs> no, I mean, if you're going to have people hear them, uh -huh. um, when you get your sound files, you're going to want to make sure that they're that they're loud, uh -huh. because this isn't this the speakers in here are terrible. Okay. But um, you know, so like. When you're doing your work, don't listen to them with headphones. Mm -hmm. Find a pair of crappy speakers and listen to it through that so you can hear if it's a good sample or not. Okay. Because um, I used to try to have people listen to hard sounds in here, and it's so bad that you can't. But murmurs are different. Mm -hmm. You can do murmurs. Okay. Yeah. All righty. Thank you. And maybe talk a little bit about where you hear them. Yes. What, what part you, you of Because you have physical examination skills, yeah. right? So... You know, you would be able to talk a little bit about that too, about how, um, you know, you